Star Wars The Old Republic is a very traditional MMORPG experience released 12 years ago at the height of bigger developers wanting to cash in on some of that World of Warcraft success in the MMO industry. The Old Republic is one of the oldest MMOs that are still relevant today, managing to maintain concurrent user counts in the thousands, which not many traditional MMOs today can claim they have. I didn't play the game on release, I only just started it recently, so today we will take a look through my first impressions and what I encountered, and hopefully this information will be of some use to you. The character creator of the game is very simple, very fitting for the year of 2011 when the game released. It features sliders, but these sliders are pretty much just cycling through presets, so there's not a whole lot of control over how you make your character look, it is very possible that you will see others looking exactly like you. While creating your character, you'll also have to pick a class. Now this game has class stories which have been separated from gameplay combat style classes which they have deemed to call combat styles. So your traditional classes in an MMO are up for grabs and can be used in multiple different stories. And now this is important because SOTOR doesn't have a overarching long story, at least not in the base game. Every single former class, in this case class story, has its own story that can go on for quite a few hours. So when you're picking your class, you're also going to have to pick your story. So if you find one you love, great, there might be more you love. If you pick one that you don't necessarily like, Never fear, there are seven more that you can look at, some considered much better or going at different paces than others. The game does have its many expansions which add more content, but just an idea of the class stories in the base game, if you're aiming to see every single quest, every single story, almost all of which are voiced, by the way. I did the math based on the pace that I'm going, listening to all the voice acting and whatnot, and you could easily spend 300 consecutive hours in the base game just seeing all the quests and whatnot running every flashpoint just one time flashpoints being dungeons i've played dozens of hours of the game already and i can tell you the main story is great so far at least the one i'm with the choices that you get are meaningful and yes there are choices this is a bioware game after all the side quests are even memorable some of my favorite quests in the entire game have been side quests which is quite interesting considering i heard that they were the worst part of the game i've had nothing but fun with them the variety is even enhanced by the fact that the empire side and the galactic republic both have completely different side quests at least in the base game and the first expansion now you see how these hours can add up to 300 just for the base game, just for story progression. Unfortunately, however, the areas you progress through in the leveling are mostly empty. Finding groups to do things with is not simple. Group content areas usually do have other players running around, however, since that is something that you are encouraged to go back and grind at max level if you want to earn credits. The deadness doesn't affect the overall playability of the game because over time they have balanced the game to be super duper easy in progressing through. You are pretty much always going to be able to slaughter everything that gets in your way in all of the solo content and a lot of the group content can be soloable if you're good at this kind of game. I specify if you're good because this game has a feature called level sync where regardless of what level you are and I might add it's very easy to get over leveled in this game you will over level way past where you're supposed to be if you're doing more than just the main quests. Level sync brings you down to the level you're supposed to be for the area you're in. It also makes it so that regardless of the area's level, you will get rewarded for whatever level you actually are. This means you're pretty much always getting some sort of progression, you know, until you hit max level, but then you know you have your credit progression and things like that, regardless of how overleveled you are. However, this cannot be disabled, which can make doing group content dead group content in older areas of the game a bit difficult if you don't have other players to play with. And you won't necessarily have other players that you bring into this game because this is a great single player story based experience, but in co-op 
it's not that good. The story content, the main meat of the game, is very hard to do in a group. If you and a friend pick the same class, you are going to have a lot of interruptions just trying to progress through the game together because you can't go through the story together. You'd have to run each thing twice or split up to do your main story instances. Doing the side quests is even a huge pain because what you pick is not necessarily what you get. You might make a choice, your friends might make choices, and whoever wins a dice roll gets to see what actually happens as the result of their actions. You'll still get credit for what you have picked, but you might end up making different choices than you would have because the dialogue trees don't always lead to the same choices. And if your friends keep winning the roles and you don't, you might not get the story that you wanted. As for the combat gameplay you will be experiencing through this leveling process, I can say it's a lot of fun. This has got to be one of the, if not the most engaging MMORPG combat systems, especially for tab targeting that I think I've ever seen. Maybe it's just been over a decade since I've seen something like this, but this game really gives you a lot of skills to spam. And the gameplay of this does involve spamming your skills quite a bit. There's always something to press. You're basically never relying on auto attacks. You are always going to be using skills. It may not feel this way at the very beginning where you have no skills, but I can tell you those skills are going to pile up really, really quickly. And I personally need three hot bars just to utilize all my skills. And yes, they all do get utilized. There's no skills that you just don't use because it doesn't match your spec. You get skills based on your spec. Speaking of skills and specs and classes and whatnot, some of you might not have any idea what I'm talking about, but MMO players surely do. And so, how easy is this game to learn? Well, I got into the game very, very easy. However, I did notice this would be a very difficult game to learn if this was your first ever MMO. The tutorial is... Well, there really isn't one. The game teaches you things through pop-ups and walls of text prompted by icons that are honestly kind of easy to miss. These walls of text are presented at times where most of the time they don't really relate to anything you're doing. You could learn about an expansion mechanic at the beginning of the base game. It did that for me. I don't even remember what it taught me anymore. I just remember encountering that weird event and I will probably not know what I'm doing when I get to that point because they gave me this tutorial at the wrong time. If you have played MMORPGs, again, I think you'll sink into this very easy. This is a very classic, traditional Western MMORPG, and if you've ever played one or you've played the Korean copycats of them, you should know how to play this game. SOTOR is also a free-to-play game, and I've made sure to test free-to-play, preferred status, and subscription based to let you know what I thought about them. If you're in pure free to play or preferred, you won't really notice any restrictions when you start the game up. All the base game is accessible to you as well as the first two expansions. The early on restrictions are really just convenience. However, the further you get in the levels, the more you'll start to notice this when you can't get your mount as early as other players, when your mount can't move as fast as early as other players, when you can't get it as fast anyway because you need 1.2 mil credits to get the fastest speed and you can only hold 1 mil credits because you're a free-to-play player and there's a credit cap. When you're progressing in something that needs you to craft but you can't do crafting very easily without making like dozens of alts because all the crafting skills work together and you can only have two per Per character whereas a subscriber can have three per character and I will tell you this is no rule of twos they are intended to work in threes this is not just an alt friendly game which it really really is but it's more of an alt forced game with the crafting like I mentioned and all the different stories well you won't even be able to see all of them as a free-to-play player with things like character slot restrictions and other restrictions you will end up being very limited the more you go preferred status grants certain benefits that can get you a little further and if you subscribe even once you will be preferred status for life not to mention every expansion in the game will be permanently unlocked to you and accessible thanks to things like level sync but I can tell you you should not approach this game expecting it to be a free-to-play game fully approach it as a freemium game 
The free to play part is very much there to let you get a taste. You will be expected to subscribe later on, at least once. Something else to note is that there is an in-game cash shop to also support the game. I will say this is one of the least problematic cash shops I think I've ever seen in a MMO, at least in the past five or six years. Almost everything is exclusively cosmetic or convenience based. There's virtually no pay to win items on there. However, there's a good thing and a bad thing. It's more of how you take it and I'll let you be the judge of it. Almost everything in the cash shop, be it something cosmetic, be it something cosmetic that has stats that you can just easily get in game anyway, or be it something that is convenience based, like unlocking more appearances in the character creation, can be sold and purchased on the in-game trade network with other players. This technically means that just about everything on the cash shop can be accessed by any and every free-to-play player with some simple end-game grinding. This also means that there is a way to spend real money in the game and convert it with a middleman into credits. I know you could take that in a good or a bad way, so I'll just supply you with the information. I should also mention that there are loot boxes, although everything in these loot boxes, from what I can tell, can just be purchased directly anyway, and you might as well just purchase them directly anyway, but there are loot boxes. I just thought you might want to know that. <laughs> now, one question I hear a lot when it comes to MMOs is, is it too late to get into this game? I, for the longest time, didn't understand what this meant, and I now understand more thanks to learning more about World of Warcraft today. And I could tell you, no, it is not too late to get into this game. Every expansion is additional content. This isn't like WoW, where the game is built for only the current expansion and all the old stuff gets invalidated. Really, separately, you are expected to go through all the content. It is kept fresh, it is kept relevant, it is kept an integral part of your character's story. And so, this is probably the best time up till now to get into the game. There's so much to do, and there's always more being added. And on the topic of always more being added, another question I always hear is, is the game dead? Updates beyond maintenances are a clear sign that a game is healthy enough and profitable enough to keep going, at least for a while longer. I can tell you this game is in nothing resembling a life support mode. It does get content updates, but I must mention that in the recent year or two, they've been more infrequent than the past, instead being replaced by technical updates, such as moving the game to DX11 and 64-bit instead of 32-bit on DX9, which it's been until literally just a week or two ago, actually. They always seem to be introducing new stories, new mechanics, new ideas, but this also means things are constantly changing, and sometimes certain systems get abandoned from older game states, like the base game and some expansions being improved upon and some expansions is just replaced completely. One example of this is in the base game, there's this fun little on rails starship mode where you fly around, upgrade your ship, and fight the enemy. It's a neat little distraction and has a reputation and titles that go with it, and it's a good way to maybe grind some credits and a way to change up your gameplay pace. From what I can tell, after the base game, they didn't even bother with this system and instead focused more entirely in terms of space combat on a PvP Galactic Starfighter mode. This is unfortunate because, you know, not everybody likes PvP, but this is a good example of they make a system and then they stop using the system in later expansions. But it's still there, and it's still enjoyable when you're in the content meant for it. Now, an important factor of the game, and the reason why I actually waited for the 64-bit client to release before playing it, is how has the game aged, technically? Well, the graphics, at least in the base game, are clearly from 2011. Like, don't expect anything crazy. This is an MMORPG that was designed to run on a single core and hardware that predates even the Radeon 290X. So, this is a while ago. There haven't been any big graphics overhauls, especially not in old content. However, there have been, as I mentioned, performance overhauls, like moving the game to 64-bit and whatnot. However, and I hate to get so negative, I don't know what the 64-bit update even did for this game. When I play this game, I have a AMD 5700 XT and a 3700X. 
These are amazing parts for the year I bought them, 2019, well beyond 2011, and they still hold up really well today, with almost no games really able to truly tax them. When I run this game on minimum settings and maximum settings, I get the same exact FPS. There is seemingly no optimization difference that can utilize my hardware. The performance is not great. The game stutters all the time, regardless of settings, regardless of tricks, regardless of the bajillion things I found on Google to try to fix it. Certain parts of the UI, especially from later vendors in the game, will freeze the game for several seconds at a time. When I'm moving around in combat when something dies, the game just jumps like it rubber bands me because it's like it doesn't know where I am or where anything is for a moment. And since I've been streaming the game, I noticed something very peculiar. There's a single graphic setting in this game, which is basically an anti-aliasing of shadows. And this one setting by itself consumes more GPU than every other setting combined. It maxes out my GPU, in fact, and causes anything that relies on hardware acceleration on my computer to hang, including my browser, including chat platforms, and this actually makes the game near impossible to stream in conversations, which for some reason consume the most GPU of anything in the game. Obviously the fix was to simply turn this down or off, which I've done. However, something to keep in note if you encounter similar issues in the game. There is also a memory leak, at least on the Steam client that can pop up. I fixed this by turning the Steam overlay off, but while it was open, I would consistently get memory leaks that would eventually make the game a non-stop stutter fest, even in empty areas with like nothing to load. There's also a bug where if you click off of the game, for example, and click back onto it, your game will just like spin around, like your mouse will freak out. And this will also happen just in normal gameplay as well, when you newly right or left click on the screen. I haven't found a way to fix this, but I lowered my polling rate on my mouse by 10 times and it's made it more tolerable at the very least. There are plenty of visual bugs where things just randomly appear, disappear, break. There's too many to really go off and list for first impressions. And overall, there's just so many bugs that take you out of the experience of the game and remind you that you are just in a game, even in the coolest moments of the game. This is a very buggy game. It might be the most buggy MMORPG I've ever played if you exclude one or two that simply have not run for me at all a long time in the past. Since it's Star Wars, you might be curious to know the lore and how they handle it, and I won't really bother talking about that either because according to Disney, none of this ever happened anyway, so who cares what's lore accurate or not, right? But I'm sure I've now crammed your head full of information from my my first days of play here, and I hope you found it helpful. I will let you draw your own conclusions of the game from that, but I will also offer my own opinion. I think SOTOR is a very fun game if you know what you're getting into. Not the most approachable from a brand new MMO player, but easy to slip into for long-term MMO players. Big fans of Star Wars I think will love this. Those that do not know much about Star Wars I don't even know if they should really try it, to be honest. Like I said, approach it like a freemium game. The free to play is there to help you test the experience and I think it's great at that. You won't feel very restricted until later on. I think the game is worth the sub if you meet the things I just said. I subbed and I know I'm gonna have a lot of fun continuing to stream the game and experiencing all there is to experience. I hope this video was helpful to you. Thank you guys very much for watching and I hope I'll see you on another video.